Hello and welcome everyone. Sorry, I just needed to set the counter. This is Mary Magnuson and on behalf of the Blandon Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar about DIY tools and strategies for communities Google Fiber is not calling. This is one in a series of monthly webinars we're offering for our Blandon Broadband communities and open to anyone with an interest in using technology to improve community. In a moment, I'll be handing over the reins to Bill Coleman of Community Technology Advisors, who will provide some introductory remarks and introduce today's presenter, Ron Corvo of COS Systems. But before Bill introduces the panel, or the speaker, I should say, I'll point to the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. To interact with us at any time during today's webinar, you can simply type your question or comment into the chat box. I'm sure that many of you on the webinar today know Bill Coleman of Community Technology Advisors, but for those who don't, Bill has been Blandon Foundation's primary broadband program consultant for a number of years. Bill? Thank you, Mary. Uh, I'm excited today to introduce Ron Corvu uh, uh, of COS Systems. Uh, I met Ron just not long ago at the uh, Broadband Communities Conference in Austin, Texas where he was showcasing his, uh, his set of tools that I think have a lot of value uh, for communities as they think about uh, extending broadband networks uh, uh, to where they are now. And so uh, Ron is the general manager of COS Systems and they have their primary products are the COS Business Engine and Marketplace and the Service Zones software that enables the demand aggregation, planning, financing, and management of community fiber networks. In his role at COS Systems, Ron is developing new markets in the Americas, working with community leaders, network planners, and engineers, FTTX uh, vendor and suppliers, network owners, and operators. Throughout his career, Ron has worked in executive business development roles at several startups and public companies, including IBM, EMC, Legato Software, OTG, and CA Technologies. In these roles, he's established and grew partnerships with software and networking uh, industry leaders, consultants, resellers, integrators, and outsourcing partners to deliver leading edge solutions to network communications, computing, and storage challenges. He holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Economics and Political Science from University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Ron, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to uh, some, uh, some great folks that are undertaking um, very, um, very uh, important in uh, community focused efforts at improving their um, internet infrastructure. Uh, I'm working with uh, similar projects on a lot of communities around the country and working with uh, my own community here in Newport, Rhode Island, um, trying to uh, get a, um, a uh, community network off the ground uh, over here as well. So I'm uh, uh, not just familiar with tools and technologies, um, to get this thing done based on our products, but I'm also familiar with the challenges that uh, uh, a community faces trying to improve the internet uh, infrastructure it has. So um, first of all, uh, maybe I'll just kick it off by saying that uh, if anyone has a question, just type it into the chat box and um, I'll be more than happy to try and address it. Uh, if I can't address it, uh, address it immediately, I will uh, come back to you and uh, address it at the first uh, chance I have uh, for a logical break in the uh, discussion. So um, first of all, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything when I say that we have uh, certainly a lot of challenges when we're trying to improve our uh, internet infrastructure in the community. Um, it's a key initiative uh, around the country and uh, the incumbents aren't making it easy uh, because in, uh, in the case of uh, my city on uh, an island off the coast of Rhode Island, uh, the incumbents were watching them announce programs in other parts of the country 
and trying to engage them to work with us. Uh, I have BTOP funded fiber literally 152 feet from where I'm talking to you right now. And uh, I got a proposal from the incumbent provider to deliver me for $30,000 a connection to that fiber that's 152 feet away and uh, charge me $500 a month for a two megabit connection over that fiber. So um, that's the way incumbents like to cooperate uh, has been my experience, okay? And unless they uh, face competition, whether it's from your own community efforts or some other incumbent like at Google, uh, they won't do much. Uh, they used to be in monopolies that aren't challenged. So, so one of the one of the key things I wanted to talk about is uh, a lot of community network initiatives often have a um, a real dedicated bunch of people, as I'm sure um, you could uh, confirm with your efforts, right? But they don't necessarily uh, know what to do uh, in order to proceed. Uh, oftentimes, um, you're trying to organize things, use spreadsheets and meetings and task lists and, um, and so forth. And uh, we found, uh, that um, communities need expertise and tools that help you uh, identify where is the demand for fiber and, and turn that into a business case by documenting uh, who actually wants these kind of internet resources and is willing to make some commitments. And uh, um, we find that the most successful approach to deliver a working network comes when um, uh, when there is great interest and a great business case because you know those networks are going to be uh, successful right out of the box. And uh, Tom, I, I uh, wanted to let you know that I will be able to send a copy of that presentation or I'll work with Mary and uh, Bill to make it available. So um, perhaps the, uh, the most important thing is uh, it's really hard to figure out what it's going to cost to build a network and what kind of revenue it's going to produce. Uh, oftentimes you can um, do some back of the envelope calculations and say, okay, well, it's going to cost me fifty or $60,000 a mile to deploy network infrastructure. Um, and in some places it can be half or one-third that. Uh, and uh, uh, you always are left guessing for revenue. And uh, that's one of the things our service zones product uh, can help with. Um, so in any case, moving on. Uh, I'm showing you now. Uh, one of the big um, dilemmas or one of the um, kind of big issues that comes up when a community decides to build their own. And uh, my company comes out of Umia, Sweden. We've been de developing and delivering solutions for uh, building uh, community-owned fiber networks for about 10 years. And uh, we um, uh, actually have uh, over a half a million ports that we manage, uh, somewhere almost 200,000 customers across uh, approximately 50 communities uh, throughout Sweden. And that's kind of where we got our background to do this kind of stuff. And uh, if you look at this picture that's on the screen right now, you see uh, an example of what we were given at one point by one of our customers uh, as a um, who's a municipal power company in uh, in northern Sweden uh, who said, "Hey, look, this is all the places we've had customers come back. Every one of these little dots 
is where a customer has come back and responded to a survey that they wanted fiber broadband, okay? And we're wondering if you've got a solution that can help us understand where we should build first and how we should proceed with this project because we don't have unlimited funds and we want to make sure that we're able to build out throughout the whole area, but we don't necessarily have the funds to do it all at once or even do it all in one year. So they were faced with what many communities that I've been talking to here in the U.S. Uh, are faced with is, you know, if we build it, will they come? That's one of the key answers that uh, communities are facing. These are very expensive infrastructure uh, projects. Um, and you also have other communities that say, okay, well, uh, if I want to do this, uh, where's my best investment? Is it downtown? Is it in the business and industrial parks? Uh, or is it uh, you know, some combination of both? What everybody wants to know is, is there a way I can figure out that building 25% of my network will deliver 50% of my revenue? And um, these numbers uh, aren't too far from the truth when you look at um, quite a majority of broadband networks, is you'll find that uh, a great proportion of the revenue comes from uh, a rather small, dense, or um, uh, kind of a demographic uh, that has very, very uh, low cost of construction and very high ARPU, or average revenue per user. So this is the challenge. Where do we build in here such that we can uh, kind of get started with a uh, network that meets the needs of the community and doesn't break the bank? So um, what, what I'd like to talk about is a, uh, uh, one of our products, which is called Service Zones, um, that was built to actually give you the kind of answers um, that you need to build a community network. And uh, it identifies uh, where the greatest amount of interest is and maps that against a set of services that people have indicated they're interested in buying at specific prices. Now the way Service Zones does that is we automatically create a series of websites. And in this example over here, what you see is kind of a, uh, a darker green circle. And that would be the service area. That would be, for example, a uh, community or a county uh, or some other um, uh, geographic region that you trace out in a polygon, okay, as we've done here. Now what happens in service zones is we allow you to break that service area up into a number of service zones that you see indicated in this light green. And what you'll see is we've got about, uh, I don't know, close to 20 service zones in the service area. And uh, a single service zone that you see here in blue might uh, be represented like uh, this down in my lower right-hand corner. And what service zones lets you do is it walks you through a process of identifying where your best business case is. Let's say this is the entire area you want to build out over a space of uh, potentially uh, a few years, right? Service Zones lets you identify where you can build and which specific area of a community is the best place to start because if you start there based on uh, user surveys, financial demographics, and uh, financial uh, cost and revenue projections will give you the best 
return on your dollar. And these are the kind of tools the incumbents have, and usually uh, they're tools that are run by the marketing and engineering uh, organizations. Uh, now, what you see right here is you see a bunch of little blue dots. Those represent uh, people who have done surveys. And then you see some green dots. Those represent people who have already signed up for service. And you'll see a few black dots over here, which are um, uh, the champions, kind of the local uh, folks that are helping to make the network happen. And Service Zones manages all of those different roles, all of those different capabilities. Um, one of the other things, because Minnesota is very rural, uh, there's probably some FCC funding that's available for um, uh, bringing in uh, telephone or communication services. One of the things Service Zones can do is overlay your service area with information from the FCC that uh, shows how much money is available to serve uh, uh, customers or uh, residents in specific areas. So the darker, as you see up here, the darker the, um, uh, the shading, uh, the more funding's available, the lighter the shading is seen down here. And then you can just click on any one of these maps and it'll show uh, what the funding is for that area. So if you're uh, representing um, a rural community, one of the things service zones will do is let you know exactly what census tracts in your community have uh, potential funding available from the FCC to help uh, finance your network. Now, one of the key things that Service Zones enables you to do um, that's very, very helpful, and we're not recommending that communities can completely do this stuff on their own unless you've got someone that is. Um, uh, very expert in making and building um, uh, telecommunications networks or, or uh, has industry experience, you're probably going to need to work with a consultant. And I'm going to tell you that there are very, very few communities that don't need to have some real consulting expertise in there. Uh, but one of the things that Service Zones does is it lets you um, have access to some great information that a consultant can help you with. And what it allows you to do is uh, conduct surveys. And um, one of the things that, that we do is uh, the same way you made of uh, seeing Google, where they conducted surveys and got people to tell them uh, what kind of services they wanted and, and so forth. Uh, service Zones lets you do the same thing. We let you know what days of the week, what weeks of the month, what months of the year uh, people filled out these surveys. And uh, so if you undertake a marketing effort to uh, promote your community network, you might see a surge in people taking surveys after you have a uh, maybe a community meeting at a school or at your town hall or whatever. So um, the ability to track the progress of a survey, what days of the week people take survey. Um, we map these surveys on, on uh, survey responses on a map. So you can see in this case, these cities right here are, uh, or excuse me, these streets right here in the city are uh, much more uh, interested than these streets right here, where we can see there's nobody that's taken a survey. So one of the things you might want to do is try and recruit a champion that can reach out to his neighbors in this particular area and uh, organize a community event. 
uh, there and uh, and get the take rate up or the interest rate up uh, in putting a network in. Uh, one of the things we also do is we um, help you build a competitive landscape against existing services that are out there because we know in the real world it's not just about uh, well yeah we want a community network somehow we'll figure out how to pay for it but oftentimes what happens is when you do start uh, to undertake these efforts the incumbents will come back with uh, kind of uh, competitive uh, threat programs where they offer uh, special discounts uh, for a period of time uh, to kind of lock you in or lock customers in uh, to their service. And we let you track that kind of stuff in your um, community network rollout program so that you uh, understand what the competitive landscape is as you're talking to people about work. And then um, we also have uh, yet another report that lets you uh, figure out what areas of your town or community uh, have the highest revenue potential. Because if you can start building a network in those areas that have either great need uh, and are willing to pay, uh, help uh, pay, uh, for more services that will fund your network, uh, those areas is then the best place to start building the network so the network is potentially generating cash right from the beginning. And if you look at this area that I've, driven, um, I've surrounded in this yellow cir circle, um, that represents the area of the uh, highest potential revenue, so the most premium services, the fastest internet speeds that are indicated in the surveys that Service Zone lets you do. So um, right here is actually some real live data from um, a community we're working with here in Rhode Island, surprisingly enough. And it, it shows the status of people having taken surveys and sign-ups. Uh, once again, it shows a couple of champions, one here, one here. Uh, actually, there's about four in here. And it also uh, gives you an overview of our process panel. And one of the key things is because um, uh, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to building a community network, uh, we've provided a roadmap and a workflow for how to go in and identify uh, the, vari the various steps and um, give you a way of, uh, for example, potentially pivoting and saying, okay, well, here we go. We've got a service zone here that we've got a very, very high interest at the north end of this service zone, got another high interest in the south end of the service zones. One of the things the panel will let you do, as long as you haven't made any commitments to anyone, it'll let you either go in, discard this zone, and maybe create another zone where we take these folks right here and we put them in this part of the community, or we take this little area right here and we combine it with another piece, and uh, we say, okay, right now that's, that's the greatest interest, and if we build those pieces first, based on the density, they will um, pay for themselves fairly quickly. Um, and uh, getting back to uh, Jan, uh, she asked the question, does service zone use the addresses from survey participants to map and then bring in the census data? And the answer is yes. Basically, what happens is uh, for the census data, uh, what service zones does is it um, goes in 
and loads the information from the FCC eligible um, eligible funding locations database, which it publishes. Um, it locates the pins on the map by having uh, survey participants enter their address, and it then looks it up in Bing Maps. So that's uh, that's basically uh, how it's done. And uh, like I said, the, the key thing behind service zones is our process. And um, as you know, uh, for those of you that are working on uh, a network, um, kind of building a community network is all about uh, knowing what to do next and realizing it may be an iterative process. So service zones walks you through from the initial setup of service zones through an analysis of, uh, in a large community, you may have as many as 100 zones. And what's going to happen is it's going to become very clear as the program gets underway that there might be 20 that are immediately looking like they're, um, like they're uh, very, very active. And that lets you focus on getting those first 20 zones in good shape while you apply more marketing resources in those areas where it doesn't appear as though uh, there's uh, as much interest. So once again, once you've, once you've whittled down, well, what are the areas that are most interesting? You can start comparing them using our deployment router. And uh, basically what this allows you to do is say, well, Based on what we've seen, we might have started looking at 100 different areas, 100 different neighborhoods, but we've got five that are really good cases that it's worth investing the money it's going to cost to actually engineer a solution. Now, that doesn't mean that these other areas won't ever get touched, but what it means is you've got to work at making uh, a better effort to engage those folks, get people to indicate interest, and so forth. And then what happens in the deployment router, we're actually looking at uh, which area has the lowest cost of construction, the highest potential revenue, and uh, the most committed customers. Because by the time we get to the business validator case, we're uh, going to come out and say, all right, we're already showing a 40, 50, maybe even a 60% take rate in this one zone. So we're going to make a commitment to start building the network there, okay, realizing that it will generate cash to help fund those areas that have a less, uh, uh, a less compelling business case. So we have all of this workflow built into the system. So what I'm going to do is uh, very quickly work you through a case study. And um, this smart build approach is one of the key things service zones lets you do. So if we want, wanted to build in this community right here, this is approximately 20,000 homes, OK? And if we want to go in and build 20,000 homes at an average of, let's just say, $1,200 per home past, you're talking about a fairly expensive project, 20, 30, maybe $40 million. What service zones lets you do in a strategic smart build-out process is we started out, we said, well, we'll build a service, service zone here because we happen to think that this is a great place, high residential density and so forth. Um, and then we'll do it over here because this is a bunch of student housing and uh, we think that these folks will really want it. And then we'll have uh, another uh, area here, maybe this is high-end housing. And after we've done the surveys and after we've applied some marketing and so forth, it might become really, really clear that we could build a network that pays for itself 
by extending out in this case into this area, and maybe this is a, a retail or a commercial area, and that wasn't part of the original set of assumptions. And then we'll come in and say, we're only going to take part of this for our initial bill. And maybe the rest of this will be in a phase two or a phase three. But if we build everything within these yellow lines, uh, those areas will pay for themselves immediately and make your, uh, make your network uh, as successful as it can be by applying as little capital as you can. And this is the same approach that many incumbents use. But with a community network, it just says that if I can capture most of the revenue up front, uh, I'll be able to come up with a plan. And Service Zones has tools that will allow uh, sponsors to uh, come in and uh, pledge money and so forth. Uh, to build out the entire network. But here's, um, here's kind of where, um, uh, and I'm just going to wait a second. I'm going to go through this, and then I'll get to your question, Jim. So um, first of all, by building where demand exists and the numbers work, in this case, if we went with a traditional build it all, end to end, everything that was in that original picture I showed you, the first thing, it might take up to four years, and, you know, it's going to cover eight or ten square miles, and you're talking about a $24 million project, right? Using our smart build process that service zones can tell you, so you build it a zone at a time as the zones make a good business case, I can build out 25% of that network at a cost of a little over $4 million and get a 68% take rate. And that's a really critical metric, right? Because if you have uh, the entire network built wall to wall without consideration for demand and business case, uh, you drop to 17% take rate on a much larger investment making it a much more difficult business case to make to someone who is um, a potential funder for the network, right? So if you look at this, in this case, you build the whole network, it's going to take you almost nine years to pay back that money. If you just build uh, the pieces that make sense initially, the pieces that can fund themselves, you can return capital in as little as a year and a half or two years. And what that just means is that, you know, we have cold, hard facts here. Um, you know, is it better to borrow $24 million and take four years to build something out? It's not going to pay back for at least nine years. Or borrow effectively a quarter of that, have a very successful network built out in a couple of years, that helps finance the rest of the um, network build out. So uh, looking at the question from Jan, uh, for rural areas with low densities, if a new network starts with denser areas, there are often overbuilt conflicts with other providers that slow down initial de development of the new, new network. Uh, what situations are best suited for the denser first uh, approach? And uh, what we've seen is using these surveys, you don't ever start building until you actually get customer commitments. So oftentimes, what we'll do is we'll find the central business district or an industrial park that's located not too far from um, a denser housing community or an MDU community, or maybe it's uh, 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 a, a place that um, has new housing development going in. Those are the kind of areas uh, that drive this denser first approach. Um, so uh, 
I know that this was kind of quick. It was a very high-level overview. I'm more than happy to provide detailed presentations, detailed overviews of service zones um, to anyone that's uh, interested. Um, are there any other questions? I see Tom has, uh, has got a question. Uh, Mary, Bill, um, how do you normally um, uh, go from here? Okay, so uh, we got a question from Tom Norton. Our municipalities consider building a network yeah. in an undeveloped 92-acre manufacturing with hopes of attracting tech companies. How could they go about this? Okay, so here's a, a really good example of uh, they're looking to develop something in an undeveloped area, so there's no one there today, right? Now, you can say pretty clearly uh, there's not going to be much demand in those areas, right? But if you build in an area that uh, has a great business case and you make it clear that Building out a network in um, a denser downtown area uh, will result in creating a business case so we can build out in this 92-acre economic development zone. That is the, um, the idea that service zones would use. So what you would do is you would draw a service zone that would say, if we build this piece, and I'm just going to go up to an example I had earlier here, okay? If we build this piece of the network here, okay, it's going to pay for this area right here that has virtually no development. So we're going to include this area, this economic development zone, and I'll just point it right here because we can afford to fund it because of the revenue that's coming into here where it's very, very dense. And over here we have a very high take rate uh, in these very dense housing communities because this right here is MBUs, this is high-end housing, and there is a shopping mall right here that we're going to catch part of that mall and we're going to be able to feed that mall from this side and this side, or from this side, and uh, and by by connecting the shopping mall and these two halves of the community, we're able to build a very compelling event where we're able to cover this very low density area that we're targeting for development, and maybe this area that we're targeting for development. So does that answer your question? Okay, fantastic. Any other questions? Ron, can you we'll talk a little bit about a how uh, people access your project product? Um, yeah, well, um, so first of all, Service Zones is a cloud-based solution. It lives in the Microsoft Azure cloud. And uh, a community can survey up to 10,000 service locations um, for, well, why, why, don't we, why don't we just say that the list price for our product is about $48,000 a year, okay? And that would enable you to survey all the respondents uh, or all of the homes in your area, uh, all the businesses, figure out uh, where all of this is. You get about 200 pages worth of reports uh, that talk about all of this. Uh, and if you work with a network planner, okay, and the network planner uh, offers you some services, uh, uh, a network planner or consultant could wind up giving you a package deal that involves using service zones, creating all of these reports, 
uh, and also, uh, you know, a set of other services that help the community make this successful. Thank you. Uh, so, was, am I right that there's a module that helps estimate the uh, construction costs of the network? How does that work? And how does that compare okay, to like so, the FCC cost model? So, so this is perfect. One of the things, if you see these lines between all of these different buildings over here, right? Um, these lines that you see on the network are part of our business case validator. They show, okay, if we were to go and do a deployment, either along utility poles, or if there's existing conduit or municipal fiber available, okay, um, we'll go ahead and identify that path and automatically calculate how many feet of fiber uh, what your cost of construction is, for example, this neighborhood might have a much lower cost of construction because it's got a lot of multiple dwelling units, or this ne uh, neighborhood might have a much lower cost of construction than um, some of the more, uh, some of the less dense areas. Like over here, we've only got a half a dozen large houses, uh, or maybe a dozen large houses. So that's going to be uh, much, it's going to cost you a lot more to connect fewer houses over here than it is to connect dozens of residential units in this MDU complex, in this apartment or condo complex. Um, yeah, and um, and coming back to Jan, uh, I see your observation. Um, I mean, one of the things I, I just want to point out is um, I don't know if any of you communities have, uh, any of the communities on the phone has a pot of gold with unlimited resources, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet that there are very few communities that have a uh, pot of gold hanging around somewhere that'll let you spend money however you choose and not have to worry about how we're going to pay for this all. And this is one of the really key items about service zones. We let you make those decisions. We let you lay out how this network might look and give you facts and figures that you can make planning decisions with. So if you look at the, um, uh, at the example that uh, Tom gave earlier is, you know, we're looking to take this 92-acre undeveloped area and uh, bring super high-speed Internet to it. Well, you can do that if you have all of the revenue that comes from connecting this very important high density, high demand location, this will give you the resources you need to come in and, and uh, put infrastructure in here because it's being paid for by this build out and so forth. <laughs> so, uh, so this is, um, you know, this is the way Service Zones does it, folks. And uh, like I said, I just gave you a very, very brief overview. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I'm happy to do is follow up uh, with any of you. You can um, uh, reach out to me. Uh, my, my email is on the presentation. My phone number is on the presentation. And uh, you can also go to www.servicezones.net, and uh, there's a, uh, a place that you can sign up to get put on our mailing list or to contact me directly from there. Mary? Yeah, um, one of the things that uh, 
I would just show you is, uh, you know, uh, this is all done using powerful web-based tools, right? Uh, this one slide I kind of, um, uh, I, I kind of hid because I wasn't sure how much time we were going to have. And uh, at the top level, you could deploy service zones across the entire state of Minnesota, okay, or across an entire county. And the top page that's created by service zones lets you talk about your project, lets you talk about the goals for the state or county deployment. And then you bring it down to an area. And once again, this is all managed automatically by service zones. And you might want to take each community and make that an area. And uh, those areas, OK, get their own page, their own branding, uh, their own information, their own champions, their own sponsors. And then you break that down into neighborhoods or zones and they each get their own page and that's where you can see what services are available on the network and so forth so that's um that's now a, a little more complete overview of service zones so um and i, I thank you for uh, all of your questions i see we got another one okay well thank you to tom and jan appreciate you participating um if there's any further questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'll get back to you right away with, um, uh, with any further information you need. All right. Any final thoughts, Bill? I don't. No. Thank you. All right. Um, I mean, I, I guess we'll wrap this up then. Yeah. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, I don't know if uh, people would want. I'd be more than happy to give a more detailed demo of how to use the system and so forth uh, in a future one. More than happy to come back to this group, repeat this, make some changes, um, do whatever. Well, thank you. I'm sure if people are interested, they'll let us know, and we'll get back in touch with you. Okay, well, thanks so much, Mary. Thanks so much, Bill. Thanks, Tom and Jim. And Jim. Thank you, Bill, for joining us on the webinar today, June 12th from 3 to 4 p.m. And the topic is Approaches for Local Governments to Expand Internet Access with Christopher Mitchell of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Thanks, everyone, for, for attending, and have a great rest of your day.